Every so often, a piece of art comes along that makes you feel a deep, sinking feeling in your stomach. You know what I'm talking about. They're the things that live in our cinematic, artistic, television and literary landscapes that exude a sense of unexplained dread. Works that are all the more dreadful because that feeling is left unexplained. You can't account for it. You're just stuck there in that headspace with no explanation, no apparent rhyme nor reason for the feeling. Such works are, for all intents and purposes, enigmas. Puzzles that take time, consideration, and, yes, work to really appreciate. Well, I've got a new one to add to the list. The Neon Demon is Nicholas Winding Ruffin's latest cinematic endeavor. Put simply, there is more going on in this film that it seems many viewers are noticing, and I wanted to take some time to share my thoughts. In this installment of Nightmare Masterclass, I analyze the Neon Demon. Stay tuned. I saw The Neon Demon shortly after its release last June, and my initial reaction to the film was one of ambivalence. Ruffin is perhaps best known for his 2011 film Drive, a crime drama starring Ryan Gosling. The film was praised up and down for its stylish foray into neo-noir cinema, as evidenced by Ruffin's follow-up, an obtuse and inaccessible film called Only God Forgives, and now The Neon Demon. The man has a penchant for taking certain risks in his movies. That's a good thing in my book, and since this is my first foray into cinema, I will disclose right off the bat that I am not a film critic, nor am I particularly well versed in film theory. But I do think that I have a unique take on this film, and that's why I wanted to share it. Clearly the cinematography is masterful, it's a beautiful, vibrant film, but upon first viewing I couldn't quite grasp what, if anything, the movie was trying to say. And that's alright. Not every movie is going to have an immediate, concrete message for every viewer. Nor does it have to. But The Neon Demon did leave an impression on me, and it left me with the feeling that there was more to it than I was really getting on my first viewing. In these intervening months, I have found myself mulling over the events of the film. Occasionally, I have found that certain commercials and print advertisements have jarred my memory of the film's distinct imagery. It stuck with me. so. I recently revisited the film for another viewing. The Neon Demon depicts a beautiful young girl's experience trying to make it as a model in Los Angeles. Ruffin takes the audience on a visual journey, one that, due to a certain lacking in story, might be labeled as masturbatory, superficial, and perhaps self-indulgent. Critics and audiences alike are solidly divided on this one. The consensus reads as follows. The Neon Demon is seductively stylish, but Nicholas Winding Ruffin's assured eye can't quite compensate for an underdeveloped plot and thinly written characters. Is that a fair assessment? We'll talk about it. But first, let's review the events that take place during the film. At this point, I'll urge you to please watch the film if you haven't already done so. We open on a distinctive image. Our protagonist, Jesse, played by Elle Fanning, lays on a couch covered in blood. It is revealed that the entire scene is a photo shoot. Ruby, played by Jenna Malone, introduces herself to Jesse after the shoot. She's a makeup artist. Ruby gives Jesse a bit of advice. She says, that whole deer in the headlights thing is exactly what they want. We find out that Jesse's parents aren't around anymore. Ruby then invites Jesse to a party, and she accepts the invitation. We get a few quick shots of the party. It's dark, there's pulsing music. Then there's an abrupt cut to the ladies' room. Ruby and Jesse are accompanied by two additional characters, Gigi and Sarah. They're both models. The woman makes small talk about different types of lipstick. Ruby asks, are you food or are you sex? As it so happens, this is perhaps the central question of the entire film. Gigi replies that Jesse is dessert because she's so sweet, an ironic comment in light of the film's conclusion. 
The women comment on how beautiful Jessie is. Ruby calls her perfect. Gigi discusses her recent plastic surgery procedures. She sings the praises of a certain doctor and becomes callous when Jessie asks an offhanded question. She says, I hear your parents are dead. That must be really hard for you. We find out that Jessie has no remaining family. The women attempt to prod into Jessie's personal history, but they don't get very far. All we really know about the character is that she's alone. They all return to the party and are treated to a show. A performer is suspended from the ceiling. This is one of those weird LA parties. Lights strobe on and off. They change from red to white. Jesse admires the show, exchanging glances with Ruby throughout. The following day, we see that Jesse is living out of a rundown motel. Later, she meets with a prospective agent, Roberta Hoffman, played by Christina Hendricks. She has a shoot arranged for Jesse with a notable photographer. We find out that Jesse hasn't finished high school. Hoffman retrieves a parental consent form from reception, but not before coldly dismissing another prospective client whom she determines to be inadequate. Jessie's indirectly urged to sign her own parental consent form. Essentially, she's told to commit fraud. Hoffman urges Jessie to tell people she's 19 years old. Hoffman says, people believe what they're told. Later in the day, Jessie goes on a date with Dean, the very same guy who was shooting her pictures in the first scene of the movie. They drive up to the Hollywood sign. Jessie tells Dean that when she was a kid, she used to sneak up to the roof. She thought the moon was a big round eye. She would look up and ask, do you see me? Dean asks Jessie what she wanted to be when she grew up. She says, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't write, no real talent, but I'm pretty. I can make money off pretty. Dean reassures her that she's probably good at a lot of things. He can tell. Then Jessie confesses to Dean that she is, in fact, 16 years old. He seems reticent and withdrawn after this sudden revelation. He's conflicted. Jessie expresses ambivalence towards the idea of lying about her age, as Hoffman had previously directed her to do. Dean says she should do whatever she thinks is right. He drives her home. Dean goes in for a kiss, and he's turned down. As she's headed back towards her hotel room, Dean gets Jessie's attention and indicates upwards towards the moon. It is full and illuminated. Jesse asks Dean if he wants to go out again, and he agrees. Jesse opens the door to her room and finds a menacing, beastly silhouette lurking behind her bed. She immediately informs the proprietor of the motel, Hank, played by Keanu Reeves. He and another employee accompany her back to the room to find the perpetrator of this intrusion. It's a mountain lion. The following day, Jesse has a photo shoot with Jack. Ruby accompanies her. Jessie's face is decorated in gold ornamentation like some kind of sci-fi goddess. Jack directs the crew to leave. This is a closed set, he says. Ruby offers to stay, but Jack declines. He directs Jessie to take off her clothes. She reluctantly complies. Jack begins to rub gold paint all over her body, and then he starts shooting. After the photo shoot, we find Ruby waiting for Jessie. Jessie expresses hope that Jack will jumpstart her modeling career but Ruby urges her not to get her hopes up. She says, he makes a lot of promises to young girls. Ruby warns Jessie that she shouldn't be alone with Jack in the future, but Jessie says that she can take care of herself. Nonetheless, Ruby tells Jessie that she can call her anytime she's in trouble, day or night. Ruby meets Gigi and Sarah at a diner. Both Gigi and Sarah express incredulity that Jack chose Jessie, a new model, to test out. It's unusual to them, Jack doesn't test new models. They are clearly envious of Jessie. Conversely, Ruby seems fascinated with her. Ruby says, she has that thing. Jessie and Sarah both have an audition for an upcoming fashion show. Sarah does her walk, but the designer is not interested in the least. Jessie performs her walk, and he's totally entranced with her. Sarah is clearly devastated. After the audition, Jessie hears a disturbance in the women's room. Sarah has shattered the mirror and ripped up pictures of herself in various magazines. Jessie attempts to reassure her, but Sarah rebukes the gesture. Jessie accidentally cuts herself on a shard of the broken mirror, and Sarah attempts to suck on the wound. Jessie promptly exits. In the following scene, we see that Ruby is moonlighting at a funeral home. She applies makeup to a corpse. Meanwhile, Jessie is doing her best to avoid Hank at the motel. Hank is holding her accountable for the whole mountain lion incident. She pours alcohol on her wound, Dean shows up with flowers, and she passes out. She has a dream about refracting blue triangles and envisions hands coming out of her motel room wall. 
Dean confronts Hank. He argues that Jessie shouldn't have to pay for the damages to her motel room. The two go back and forth, and Dean ends up paying for the damages. Hank taunts Dean about his relationship with Jessie and proceeds to offer up another tenant, a 13-year-old girl also staying at the motel. It's unclear whether or not he's serious. Dean walks away in disgust. He picks the glass out of Jessie's hand. Jesse preps for the fashion show with Gigi, who remains incredulous that Jesse was picked so early in her modeling career. She believes Jesse must be performing sexual favors for the fashion designer. She makes a few passive-aggressive jabs, then blathers on about all the plastic surgery she's gotten done. Nobody likes the way they look, she says. I do, says Jesse. The designer tells Jesse that he's decided she's going to close the show. They dress her in a shimmering black outfit with her hair pinned back. While she's performing in the show, Jessie experiences a vision, the very same glowing blue triangle she saw before in her dream. She sees herself in a refracting blue prism. She kisses her reflection, and the color shifts from blue to red. After the show, Jessie goes with Dean to a restaurant. The designer and Gigi are there as well. In order to make a point, the designer prompts Dean with the task of comparing Gigi to Jessie. The designer argues that natural beauty always trumps the artificial. In reference to Jessie, he says, True beauty is the only currency we have. Without it, she'd be nothing. Dean takes exception to this remark. He argues that Jessie's inner beauty is what really matters. The designer scoffs and points out that Dean wouldn't have even stopped to look if Jessie hadn't been beautiful. He says, Beauty isn't everything. It's the only thing. Dean asks Jessie to leave with him but she refuses. Jessie arrives back at the motel later to find Dean waiting for her. He asks her if she really wants to be like those people. She says, I don't want to be them, I want to be me. Later that night, Jessie has a nightmare where she is sexually assaulted by Hank with a knife. She wakes up and hears someone attempting to break into her room. Jessie quickly engages the deadbolt, only to hear the would-be intruder break into the room next door and assault the inhabitant. Jessie hears the assault take place. She calls Ruby, who urges Jessie to come stay with her. Ruby makes a move on Jessie, and she's rejected. Jessie reveals that she's a virgin. Later, Ruby draws an ominous-looking diagram with lipstick on a mirror. In the following scene, Ruby inexplicably has sex with a corpse. Ruby arrives back at the house to find Jessie standing on the diving board over the empty pool. You know what my mother used to call me, she says? Dangerous. Jessie then goes on a narcissistic diatribe about how other women would kill to look like her. As she walks back in the house, she's attacked by Gigi and Sarah. A chase ensues. Jessie circles back towards the pool, and she finds herself surrounded by all three of them. Ruby, Sarah, and Gigi. Ruby pushes her into the pool, killing her. Ruby is then shown bathing in a pool of blood, presumably Jessie's, and the other women are washing off blood in the shower. In the following scene, Ruby waters plants in the yard. She's topless, and several occult tattoos are apparent on her body. She lounges on an unmarked grave in the garden, again, presumably Jessie's. Later that night, Ruby basks naked in the light of a full moon. She lays down and opens up her legs. A torrent of blood rushes out of her. In the next scene, Sarah and Gigi arrive at a photo shoot with Jack, the photographer from the beginning of the film. Another model asks Sarah if she's ever had another girl screw her out of a job, and she replies in the affirmative. What do you do? The model asks. I ate her, replies Sarah. Jack subsequently replaces that very same model with Sarah. During the photo shoot, Gigi starts having stomach trouble. She rushes off into the house. Sarah follows her. Gigi regurgitates an eyeball onto the floor. I need to get her out of me, she cries. Gigi then takes a pair of scissors and plunges them into her abdomen. She drops to the floor. Sarah eats the eyeball and returns to the photo shoot. And that's the end. I read that when this film was screened at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival, some audience members walked out. Some people shouted at the screen. Good. In my opinion, if a filmmaker is evoking that kind of reaction, they are doing something right. Ruffin takes chances. Art is supposed to evoke a visceral reaction in the viewer. If certain imagery in the Neon Demon revolted you, I think that's good. Clearly, some parts of the film are supposed to be revolting. Think of it in culinary terms. You have your sweet 
and you have your sour. But why? Is there an underlying message the film is trying to convey? If a movie only serves to evoke a visceral reaction in its audience, I would say it has stopped short of success as an artistic work. And if Ruffin was merely trying to spark controversy with this film, I'd be one of the first people condemning that shallow effort. But I don't think that's the case here. Indeed, the Neon Demon has been described as masturbatory and self-indulgent. One critic described the film as an absurd jerk-off Lolita fantasy in a slow-motion sparkly neon dress with the side order of 90s music video aesthetics. Is that valid? I can see why that might be one's first impression of the film. The central thrust of this criticism is that the film is superficial and self-indulgent. Ironically though, I think this may be a superficial, surface-level take on the film itself, but I do understand the urge to admonish a film that so shamelessly revels in the objectification of its protagonist. Like I said, I was conflicted about my feelings towards this movie after my first viewing. But to anyone saying that the film doesn't have substance underneath the surface of its slick visuals, I implore you, give it another chance. I did, and I have come to believe that there is a deeper meaning to this film. It works to illuminate something within the human condition. Allow me to explain. At the risk of being reductionist, I will say this. It is my belief that all works of art, however abstract, however outlandish, and indeed however inaccessible they may be, are, in some way, attempts to make sense of the outside world, if there is such a thing. The Neon Demon is no exception to this. In one interview, Ruffin stated that he began his career in cinema with an eye towards realism. That is, he attempted to be true to life in his work. He wanted his work to, quote, capture reality. But what does it really mean to be true to life, to capture reality? Ruffin's early filmography, the Pusher trilogy most notably, is one marked by grit. It depicts the seedy, crime-ridden underbelly of society. On the topic of realism in his work, Ruffin later noted, I realized it was an impossible task, so I decided to do the exact opposite, which was only make heightened reality. The idea that how we see and understand reality is purely based on our perception of, is it real or not? And heightened reality is, of course, a language of fairy tales. As evidenced by his early work, we can begin to understand Ruffin's evolution as a filmmaker as one of movement from realism to a more abstract, surreal style. But to say it is merely style, I think, is to miss the point entirely. In the case of The Neon Demon, the style is integral to the discussion. After all, the film does seem to have an obsessive focus on beauty. As such, Ruffin artfully and abstractly mimics the elusive and perhaps deceptive nature of beauty itself through the film's flashy style. Note what Ruffin says in the aforementioned interview. Heightened reality is the language of fairy tales. Something is preying upon Jesse throughout the course of this entire film. Think of Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf, or Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Think of Hansel and Gretel and the cannibalistic witch they encounter. When you look at the plot mechanics, you'll see the Neon Demon fits neatly with these stories. It's a fairy tale for adults. Keep this in mind because this framing of the film sheds light on a number of things. Interestingly, Ruffin, as of late, has described himself as a, quote, pornographer. Now, what Ruffin means by this is that he makes films that excite him. He makes the kind of films that he wants to see. But, in using that term, pornographer, to describe what he does as a filmmaker, Ruffin is employing a cloying sort of self-effacing humor that masks what the Neon Demon is really about. What he does is more than pornography, but in describing his work in this way, Ruffin sets up a mythology about the origin of this film. Here's one rather telling anecdote about how Elle Fanning was cast as Jesse. He didn't cry. I walked into his house and there were princess clothes everywhere and Frozen Let It Go was like playing <laughs> and because he has his two little girls and so um, they walked out and his wife and so I realized, okay, like the king of masculinity and blood and violence is there. He has a feminine side. Um, and then he went on to ask me, do you think you're beautiful? 
And I was very uncomfortable by the question because, you know, that's, I, I didn't, he, he had explained what the story was about because all I had heard was that he, Nick was doing a movie uh, set in the fashion world with a teenage girl as the lead, which was very surprising, you know, with, <laughs> with Nick. And um, then he explained the story and then he asked me, do you think you're beautiful? And I, your, <laughs> your response was? I mean, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, if I say, I mean, I laughed and then I did say yes. <laughs> but it's like, there's a way, because we teach each other, you're supposed to love yourself and you are supposed to think that you're beautiful. But then also people take it that you're an extreme narcissist. So I guess it's that, it's a fine line. Now, I think there's more going on here than is readily apparent. Primarily, it is impossible to move on from this without pointing out the position Ruffin puts Fanning in, according to this anecdote, being asked, do you think you're beautiful? Is comparable in some respects to the position our protagonist is put in time and time again in this film. This irony can't possibly be lost on the director, can it? This is a case where I think, whether or not Ruffin intends this, his words are actually part of the work itself. In the process of promoting the film, he's playing into the very mentality that pervades the film and causes our hero's eventual downfall. Or is he? We're going to revisit this later. To the audience, or to me at least, the criteria by which these operators and agents in the fashion industry make their assessment is, well, perplexing. One scene in particular comes to mind, the audition scene with both Jesse and Sarah. Sarah performs her walk, but the designer is vacant and distracted. He doesn't even give her a passing glance. And then it's Jesse's turn, and the designer is completely and totally bewitched by her. Nonetheless, Jesse appears to be extremely uncomfortable throughout this whole ordeal. Now, clearly, there is something disgraceful about this practice for all parties involved. This is obvious to me based merely on the expressions of the characters in the scene. It's demeaning, it's demoralizing. Even for Jesse, who's viewed favorably in this exchange, it seems to me that standing in front of this vapid mustachioed fuckwad with his vest and his stupid napkin, it's all just an exercise in curtailing her own dignity. But curiously, never in the course of the film is it established that there are concrete qualities that make one worthy of consideration for this modeling venture. The film itself is duplicitous about this conceit. And this is important because not only is it the standard by which the livelihoods of these ambitious models hinge, it's a criteria by which our protagonist seems to wholly define herself. Her entire identity revolves around the idea that she's beautiful. Beauty in this film is something akin to currency. This is even stated in so many words by the fashion designer in his impassioned argument with Dean about the unparalleled value of beauty. So, think of it in terms of currency. Our paper money has no inherent value by itself. It is only upon mutual consensus that we ascribe it with value and trade it for goods and services. We agree that the dollar is valuable, and the only reason that value exists is because of that collective agreement. Except in this case, the collective agreement is about a person, a person who doesn't seem to have much say in the agreement. All of the characters in the film seem to agree that Jesse is beautiful, and paradoxically, the agreement effectively works to demean her value as a person. I mean, look how she ended up. Strangely, the film depicts Jesse's beauty in both tangible and intangible ways. On one hand, we have various characters attempting to drain the life force out of Jesse for their own benefit. Sarah tries to suck her blood in the bathroom after the audition, Ruby attempts to engage Jesse sexually, and when she gets shut down, the women murder and cannibalize her in a ritualistic fashion. So, it's apparent that, to these characters, Jesse's beauty is something that can and will be consumed. This isn't something our protagonist seems to understand, even after she's attacked in the bathroom by one of the models. On the other hand, Jesse's beauty is also depicted in an intangible fashion. It is said of Jesse that she just has that thing, some indescribable quality that makes her special. This is a myth. It is based on virtually nothing, and it sets up a cutthroat dynamic that is solely beneficial to those who have already learned to navigate and indeed profit from this inherently exploitative industry. And Jesse is not one of those people. She has virtually no life experience whatsoever, 
She has no idea how the industry operates. Conversely, the experienced Ruby specifically works to further the narrative that Jesse possesses this incorruptible sort of beauty. And there's a reason that Ruby works as a makeup artist. She operates as an accomplice in this exploitative venture. She helps build the myth that Jesse is the ideal height of beauty. And as we well know by now, Ruby is in league with Satan. As such, she helps build a narrative that works to corrupt Jesse. Of course, others are complicit in this venture. Even Dean, at the end of the day, proves himself to be helpless. He can only watch as Jesse gets corrupted. These people prop her up only to destroy her and indeed consume her. They literally chew her up and spit her out. Jesse is something of a tragic hero. The underlying tragedy of her character is that she always defines herself in relation to how others perceive her. I believe that's what the full moon represents, the ever-present, all-knowing eye of the other. Jesse tells Dean that when she was a child, she'd go up to the roof and lay under the moon and pretend it was a giant, omnipresent eye watching her. Even as a child, Jesse was overtly conscious of how others perceived her. That was her tragic flaw all along. But it wasn't until she eventually began to buy into the narrative that she ultimately succumbed to the Neon Demon. I believe the film is meant to be a parable about the dangers of allowing others to define, in blanket terms, who you are. Ruby, Jack, Hoffman, all of them reinforce the specious notion that Jesse is the height of ideal beauty. At its core, the Neon Demon is about a protagonist succumbing to the questionable narratives that others tell her about herself, and it's one that she's likely been told her entire life, and it's an incomplete, flawed story. Moreover, it only serves to further the interests of others. Who, pray tell, do these narratives benefit? Well, they benefit a certain element of the fashion industry, one which, in this film, essentially treats models like cattle. As evidenced by Hoffman's cold treatment of her would-be client earlier in the film, as well as the cold rejection offered to a slew of models during an audition, this industry is not one that tolerates imperfection of any kind. Of course, perfection is a nebulous concept, and it's subject to the uninspired whims of vapid industry insiders with questionable motives. But I don't believe the film is merely a critique of the fashion industry. The fashion industry is just the setting. I think the underlying message is a more universal sort of moral. In part, I think the Neon Demon can be understood as a critique of the institutional structures upon which our society is built, structures that foist up these paradoxical, impossible narratives about who and what we are. And they're structures that allow sociopaths to continually manipulate those narratives for their own benefit. Ultimately, the film is a critique of human nature itself. It chastises us for buying into these narratives. Now think back to Ruffin's little anecdote about how he auditioned Elle Fanning. Remember that he asks her the question, do you think you're beautiful? He doesn't force upon her his own notion of beauty. He lets her define it for herself. Yes, the film is absurd. In some ways, it is masturbatory, and indeed, yes, it is heavy-handed. But I think it's intentionally heavy-handed, and it's intentionally absurd, and it's intentionally masturbatory. I believe that The Neon Demon, the film itself, is consciously aware of its shameless dedication to aesthetics, its obsessive concern with beauty. The Neon Demon is a film that reflexively hates itself. It is revolted with its own self-indulgence. There is a stark dissonance between the visual showcase of the film's look and the grotesque nature of its content. Really, if you follow the logic of the film's conclusion, you'll see that the movie is essentially a rejection of aesthetics over substance. Our protagonist, laboring under the illusion that her beauty is going to somehow transcend the seedy underbelly of LA, has the rug pulled out under her a good three quarters of the way into the movie. And then, it's almost as if we're watching an entirely different film. As such, the film repudiates the audience for buying into the same narrative that causes Jesse's downfall. The Neon Demon follows in the tradition of films like Donnie Darko, Videodrome, Blue Velvet, and yes, pretty much every film by David Lynch. 
Such films work to illuminate something within the viewer. They're movies that don't spoon feed you the plot. They force you to pay attention. And yes, they don't always hit the mark in precise terms. I don't think The Neon Demon is a perfect film by any stretch of the imagination. The dialogue is, in large part, choppy and inorganic. The acting is a little stilted at times. And there certainly is a lack of economy when it comes to screen time. I think this film could have been cut a good 20 minutes while still retaining the integrity of its plot. Though perhaps there are well-founded thematic reasons for all of these things I'm calling flaws. Nonetheless, I do see where some critics are coming from when they say that there's a lack of character development. But I, for one, respect the urge for directors like Ruffin to make drastically unique, unconventional films. And I can't wait to see what he does next. In my head, I've been trying to nail down exactly what it is I want to do with this channel. It's something that is difficult for me to articulate, perhaps because I'm too close to it. But I also think at least it's in part due to the nature of the material I cover. Such works play with the boundaries of genre, oftentimes commingling comedy and horror and everything in between. I would say works like This House Has People In It, The Mirror, and the collective works of Titanic Sinclair fit into this category quite nicely. But I am always looking for new source material. What do you think I should cover next? Let me know in the comments. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. In the next episode, I analyze press secretary Sean Spicer's claim that Dippin' Dots is, quote, the ice cream of the past. Thanks for watching.